Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our center meeting. Today, the first speaker is Dr. Yvonne Bruna. Dr. Yvonne Bruna receives her PhD in human and molecular genetics from University of Texas and has more than 10 years of research experience in molecular genetics, RNA biology, and um, mRNA re re regulation. Additionally, she has substantial industrial CGMP expertise in gene therapies, regenerative medicine, and cancer immunotherapy. She joined Houston Methodist from Bellicum Pharmaceuticals at 2014, and now Dr. Bruna is a director of RNA Core and as well as assistant research professor of cardiovascular sciences. Under her supervision, RNA Core has developed into a reliable RNA provider with innovative methodologies of RNA manufacturing and high quality standards of operation. Dr. Bruna also leads a research team in several projects aimed to develop new cell therapies by using messenger RNA. Today, she is going to give a talk titled Overcoming Cellular Barriers for RNA <coughs> Therapeutics. Please, Dr. Bruna. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sukovershin, for such a nice introduction. And uh, we're very excited about what we're doing here. And uh, the uh, intent of this presentation today is basically to give you an update of where the field is, what are some of the barriers that uh, overall the field is facing and how we are addressing those barriers. Uh, so this is in the context of the field overall. Um, the ability for us to understand as investigators uh, gene expression allows us to understand ways of developing therapeutic approaches. And so knowing that a cell goes from a DNA into a, a pre-mRNA, they're splicing, there's processing, they're exporting, then the RNA needs to be exported out of the nucleus in the cytoplasm, it has to be um, translated, and these proteins then are further um, modified. So these are all opportunities for developing therapeutics, and the field recognizes that. So one term that we use in, in pharmaceutical in industries is the term known as biopharmaceuticals. Some of the biopharmaceuticals that you're seeing today a lot, you probably see if you cannot um, watch TV without watching a commercial about a biopharmaceutical that is now in, uh, uh, available for as a therapeutic uh, drug. So some of these biopharmaceuticals are biological in, na in nature, or they're partially biological in nature. Uh, and this ranges from vaccines, cell therapies, recombinant proteins, and nucleic acid-based therapeutics. Now, a lot of these biopharmaceuticals comprise a uh, large macromolecules, which are quite complex, and they're very difficult to produce. So a lot of these therapies are um, over $100,000 in, in, in cost. The uh, advantage is that they, because of their larger, they have specificity, and they're quite, um, potent and efficacious. This is why they've made, uh, a lot of them have made it to the market. Um, but when we look into other uh, uh, aspects of those therapeutics, is that there, it comes with challenges as well. So in order to make one of these macromolecules, one of the challenges they face is the, for instance, if you have an antibody that you are developing, making that antibody in a way that, that you maintain the, the, the solubility, that you can understand what is the base ra best route of administration, the stability, the immune responses to that antibody. So there's a lot, a lot that comes into place when considering a uh, biopharmaceutical and when develop, developing a uh, biopharmaceutical. In addition to that, add to that, now we have an understanding of the challenges that manufacturing can bring. And these macromolecules come with large challenges to, uh, in order to manufacture them. So there is a, uh, a lot of challenges that the field has to overcome in order to uh, proceed with, uh, with this type of therapeutics. Now, one um, type of molecule that is now available, uh, or is becoming, is starting to become available, and there's an understanding of its potential and its increasing uh, capability is the field of RNA therapeutics. Why all of a sudden there's a, uh, there's really an interest in the field of developing these RNA therapeutics? Um, and the reasons are RNAs 
they don't pose any risk of integrations. They are trans in the express, so the toxicity can be limited. And the, the, the immune responses can be now minimized, and I'll show you how we are doing that. But one of the best uh, aspects of RNA therapeutics is that they can be, they can pharmacoevolve. What does that mean? It means that you can quickly change an RNA molecule to address viral infections. So to keep up with viruses are, is difficult because viruses can change. And to keep up with cancer mutations, you can have a population of cancer patients. They all may present similar uh, clinical uh, uh, symptoms, but they might all be dealing with different mutations. So you can have personalized medicine. You could address pandemic viral infections quickly. Or you can actually address cancers that mutate rapidly by recognizing what are some of the aspects that have changed, what are some of the sequences that have changed, and develop molecules that are tailored to that particular uh, change. So you can do that very quick as opposed to uh, with uh, biopharmaceuticals that are uh, macromolecules. How do we do that? So the, uh, the field, what the field does is, is it generates uh, in vitro transcribed RNA. In vitro transcribed RNAs are made in, without cell systems. You have a template DNA that is linearized, and that template uh, DNA contains the uh, elements that you want the RNA to have. So the sequences that can confer stability, and they can, be, uh, they can have the sequences that, that will be translated into the protein of interest. This can easily and effectively be done, and this is something that has been done for decades. I mean, I, I did in vitro transcriptions when I was a, a graduate student, and that's where I, uh, we used to do this all the time. Um, and um, RNA can then be quickly uh, introduced into the cells, and they can then be processed. So this, you're using the cellular machinery to translate this RNA. So you're making something that the cell recognizes as self. Um, and they can be processed depending on what type of RNA and the sequences that you can uh, add to these RNAs. You can have them being presented, or you can have them being translated, or you can have them being uh, uh, processed in any ways. Now, the RNA field confers, com, uh, comprises not only large RNAs, but also small, uh, small RNAs, such as non-coding RNAs and siRNAs. Now, there's challenges that come with this, and is that RNA is subjected to RNase degradation by RNases, and RNases are highly abundant in the extracellular space. So those are one of the, the challenges that, that the field uh, has to face. And, and another challenge that the field has to uh, change, uh, face is the fact that RNA can induce innate immunity. Um, so when you have an RNA, uh, you can have a series of, uh, I mean, it's, this is an evolutionary, a billion years evolutionary defense mechanism that the cells have, mammalian cells have developed to protect ourselves from viral, mainly uh, uh, viral, uh, uh, RNA-based viral uh, uh, infectious agents. So they have an, um, layers of uh, defense mechanisms that and receptors that allow the cell to recognize them and mount an innate immune response. So this is something that, uh, for the longest time, um, made the researchers think that the RNA molecules were not really a, didn't have the potential to be a therapeutic molecule. Now the field has recognized that um, with modifications, you can lower uh, the immunogenicity of these molecules. So there's a battery of uh, modifications that one can introduce into the nucleosides in the RNA to enhance the stability of these RNAs and to uh, minimize the immunogenicity of the RNAs. And there's a lot of reviews on these. There's a lot of different modifications. So if you're interested in knowing more, uh, uh, let me know, and I can, I can share some of those reviews with you. Also, the field recognizes that in the process that I show you of in vitro transcription, there are um, contaminants that are derivatives from that process. 
So uh, either E. coli DNA, uh, DNA template, double-stranded RNA. So this is a um, publication in 2011 uh, um, that shows that this is important to recognize what these impurities are, and it's important to um, get rid of them. So in order to make a molecule that you can call therapeutic molecule and, and to have a path to the clinic, these molecules have to be highly pure. Uh, and this is just an example here of uh, 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 HPLC profiling of an RNA, and then how they take the different fractions and then they look at the different fractions and the ability of each fraction to... Um, th so these fractions were actually isolated, separated, and they were uh, transfected into cells. And then they look at the uh, innate immune responses by looking at interferon alpha, uh, levels of interferon alpha in the cells. So that you can see that different fractions have different... Um, uh, uh, levels, they elicit different levels of immune responses, suggesting that they have impurities that, are, that the cell recognizes. And then they go and they look into what these uh, uh, impurities are. So they have developed ways of uh, antibody-based methods to look at some of these impurities. And this is something that we've learned from uh, the field and that we used also to recognize these impurities and to uh, make uh, molecules that are highly pure. The field has evolved quickly, and this is why today we can say there's a, that we could put, uh, potentially have RNA in, in the clinic uh, relatively quick. Um, it started from, from uh, 12 years ago when they looked at the possibility of using modified nucleosides there's also a lot of interest in gene editing. And gene editing, uh, using RNAs for, as a tool for gene editing is a very attractive uh, tool because then you can, RNAs are transiently expressed. So then you have, uh, uh, that clean, it makes it a cleaner system and less toxic system. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, that a little bit more in details. And one of those systems that are very much uh, it makes sense to use RNA is the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, system, where mRNA, the use of mRNA for gene editing uh, makes a lot more sense. Right now, there's actually preclinical studies ranging from um, different um, uh, infectious agents, including flu. There's also vaccines, cancer vaccines, and there's a battery of uh, clinical studies that right now are uh, ongoing. <coughs> Now, when we talk about the field of RNA therapeutics, the field actually um, has evolved, and, and it's not one single molecule that we're talking about. So when they say, well, it's a billion dollar industry, they're, t they're talking about uh, various uh, different types of RNAs that are actually being tested right now in the clinic. Uh, and it ranges from, um, silencing RNAs, microRNAs, long non coding RNAs, hairpin RNAs or pre-mRNAs, uh, precursors, um, and mRNA and other double-stranded RNAs that are available as therapeutic molecules or they're being uh, studied as therapeutic molecules. And there's a wide range, this is just representative companies, there's a wide range of companies that are now uh, fully uh, engaged in developing uh, these therapeutic molecules. Why is it that it's so attractive? Wh what are some of the indications that in which RNA can potentially be useful? So this is just, this is a review in 2004 from uh, Nature, where they show all the potential uh, applications in which RNA is a viable uh, therapeutic molecule. And it ranges from cancer immunotherapies, infectious diseases, uh, vaccines for infectious diseases, uh, allergy solarization, protein replacement, genome editing, and genetic reprogramming. So as you, can, you, as you know, as researchers, these are all very hot fields, and these are fields that are uh, very much at the uh, forefront of the, the novel therapeutics that we're seeing being developed today. Um, and what is very interesting and is that the field of RNA therapeutics 
uh, is also is co-evolving with another field of immunotherapy. So immunotherapy, uh, you, you probably have all heard about immunotherapy and how this is evolving and how it's moving relatively quick uh, to the um, clinic. Uh, and the reason is because it has, it has shown to be, to have the potential to be efficacious. And imagine you're using your own bodies, uh, your own cells to attack tumors. So it's a matter of training or genetically modifying these cells to arm them with the tools that they need to recognize this tumor. So it's a very attractive uh, therapy. Uh, and there's been an immense number of, of uh, um, advances that have allowed the field to be where it is today. Um, so this is actually, this is a, a review, uh, a 2000 from Nature uh, Review in Clinical Oncology. And it's showing all the main uh, breakthroughs that have allowed us to understand that immunotherapy is a very feasible, either ranging from using macromolecules to actually using cell-based cell therapeutics to using cancer vaccines as anti-cancer therapies. So again, this is another field that is quickly evolving. So it's interesting that these two fields are evolving, but now they're starting to merge. So how th there's a synergy in combining immunotherapy with RNA therapeutics that is unique. And it makes immunotherapy a more cost-effective and more uh, feasible and, 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 and a field that, and, and, and a therapy that you can modulate quickly if you use RNA. So this is where the, the synergy of the two, uh, it's very important and is actually gaining momentum. Another thing that is, is contributing to the development of RNA therapeutics is the fact that we have uh, we have evolved and developed ways of understanding biomarkers. So what are, so one thing is, okay, you can make the RNA uh, uh, therapies, but what are you targeting? Uh, so that's equally important. So all of these fields are evolving rapidly and merging, and the synergy and the momentum that they have right now is very exciting times. Um, so they have um, anything from data from animal models or screening in, in, in actual human samples. You can find a battery of studies that are um, out there that have uh, focused on understanding biomarkers and actually even clinical studies that are uh, tailored to understanding what are those biomarkers biomark and how can we target them. Um, so this is, again, contributing to the uh, development of RNA therapeutics. But there's challenges to RNA therapeutics, and this is what I wanted to convey uh, to you today. It's all excited, but there's challenges still that we need to address. And I'm going to show you how the field is addressing those challenges today. The main challenge is delivery. Um, so RNAs are large. They're highly charged. They uh, do not have the ability to cross the lipid bilayer. So then an RNA can range, and I have the numbers here, from 4 to 10 KDs for a single-stranded antisense oligo, to 14 KD for a double-stranded siRNA, to more than 200 KD for a CRISPR-Cas9. And imagine in the CRISPR-Cas9, you, only, you, don't, you don't only have the Cas9 uh, protein, you also have the guide RNA to deliver. So it's a, it's a, a complex system that you have to co-deliver. So there's challenges on uh, how you do that. And if you look at uh, self-replicating RNAs, which is another uh, I, uh, type of molecule that is uh, available, it, it can range up to 7,000 KD. So how do you deliver these highly charged large macromolecules? Um, there's several in vivo uh, applications that are currently being tested, ranging from naked RNA directly injected or RNA complex with positively charged molecules that allow it to be less uh, uh, charged, uh, to, be, to cross the membrane. Some of these are being tested. Some of them are being shown to be efficacious, but mainly for uh, intradermal uh, or, or vaccine type of uh, approaches. If you're looking for a system that, is, that requires systemic delivery, then the challenge is, is, is different and it's, it's, a large, it's a very big challenge. 
ex vivo applications is something that uh, is, is moving forward and, and my focus of I, uh, the talk, late, the later part of the talk, is on ex vivo applications. Now, when we talk about systemic deliveries um, and any type of delivery, as I mentioned, if you look at the challenges of crossing that, that uh, um, cell membrane, and once you cross that cell membrane, do uh, you have this RNAs capture if, they're in the, if the process of, um, of introducing these mo this molecules is by endocytosis? Then you have them trapped in these uh, 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 units where they, how do you release these, these RNAs? How do you release them so that they are available in the cytoplasm and they're recognized by the cellular machinery? And how do you avoid for, um, for, for them to be, uh, not be degraded within the lysosomes. Uh, so these are all questions that we still are trying to understand and that we're, tra we're trying to address. And there's a, a range of approaches that they use the either pH-based or uh, that they, they allow the RNAs to be released um, that are addressing some of these uh, issues. But still the field is, uh, is in its infancy. Um, in, in our case, one way we're addressing this is we are working here at Methodist with a, uh, uh, several investigators that are experts in the nanomedicine field. So uh, we have uh, nanoparticles available here for testing at Methodist that range from biomimetics to lipid-based to uh, uh, polymers that could potentially serve as vehicles for delivering RNA. So this is something excited, but if I talk about this, it will be here two hours. Um, but this is something that we are addressing here. Now, there's no nanoparticles that, that uh, wouldn't come with the challenge of toxicity. So systemic delivery of these nanoparticles can also increase the, the toxicity and maintaining this as a, a delivery as a significant barrier to the field. So these are things that we need to fully understand and that we need to optimize to minimize this toxicity. Um, the, one of the examples that I wanted to give you, and this is a field that is having high momentum, when I looked, and this is, this is recent data, from all the companies that have been quickly developed just for CRISPR-Cas9. So if you think about it, a lot of them are targeting a systemic delivery. So this is, this, the, the, we need to quickly understand how RNA can contribute to these fields and how delivery, the challenges of delivery, how can we overcome the challenges of delivery? So um, in the case of the CRISPR-Cas9, and I'm just uh, showing this as an example, is we see that there are several ways that they're delivering. So if you look at how these different companies are approaching the uh, gene editing using the CRISPR-Cas9 system, they're using either lentiviruses, retroviruses, adenoviruses, but they're also using RNA. Uh, um, they're also looking at the um, uh, plasmid DNA using electroporations. But the one of the advantages of the RNA is, again, it's a cleaner system. You have the Cas9 expression, uh, uh, transient expression of the Cas9, which makes uh, it minimize the toxicity uh, and the off-target effects of having the Cas9 uh, lingering around. Um, this is just to summarize what the advantages and disadvantages of each one of them is in terms of what it requires. This is their integration. So when you're developing a therapeutic molecule, these are some of the questions that you need to address because these are the questions that the FDA will ask. Uh, what is the efficiency, the toxicity, the off-target effects, the, uh, the risks of integration? So these are all the aspects uh, that you need to look at when uh, developing some of these approaches. And this is, uh, is a recent uh, report in Protein Cell. Now, how are we addressing that? So we, have, we don't have a good delivery system yet. Uh, we're working on that. But the field needs to move forward. So when you're looking at their developing these uh, therapeutics, how are we approaching that? So the field is going for the low-hanging fruit. The low-hanging fruit is the ex vivo uh, manipulation of cells. So if you no notice here, this is the time to uh, clinical uh, 
you have, let me see if I see my mouse. You have here, the ex vivo is where the near-term opportunities are seen. Perhaps uh, localized um, uh, in vivo it's, uh, is the medium terms. Systemic approaches are the ones that are uh, long-term opportunities. Uh, so in the pipeline of opportunities for uh, the development of these therapeutics, the near term is all in the ex vivo, taking cells out of the body, manipulating them, and then infusing them back. Uh, what, one area that has very, been very successful, uh, and, and actually I have, I'll show you the, the clinical studies that are ongoing, is the vaccine, the RNA vaccines uh, uh, air technology. So it makes sense. The fact that you have RNA, um, that you're using RNA for vaccine uh, technology makes sense. And the reason is, I've listed them here. RNA can carry the required elements for the expression. You don't need to have the whole sequence. You can have different epitopes. You can combine different epitopes. You can combine elements within the RNA to present those epitopes. So you can be very clever in how you make, and you can quickly change epitopes if you think about it. So this, is, this makes it a very attractive uh, approach. Um, again, RNA is translated by the cellular machinery. Um, uh, compared to, RNA, to DNA, it doesn't need to cross the, the, um, the nuclear membrane. Um, it doesn't have MHC haplotype restriction, as you will see with proteins. Um, now we have a much better understanding of how to make this RNA less immunogenic and highly pure. And um, you can pretty much have a GMP process that can be applied to a lot of different uh, uh, molecules. Uh, with just some fine tuning. So this makes it a very attractive um, um, field, especially with the application of RNA. How these uh, vaccines, I'm gonna go quickly through this because I'm getting close to uh, the end. Basically, this is just immunology. I mean, it's, it's, you have a lot of the, the uh, vaccine approaches are using dendritic cells. The way they do is these antigen presenting cells, then they're armed with these uh, epitopes and they present it to T cells and NK cells, and then they can uh, mount an immune response uh, within the body. Uh, this uh, allows for the use of uh, RNA vaccines as an in vitro or in vivo. So technically, you can just inject the RNA and allow the cells to the body to mount uh, that immune response itself. So allow the the body to the, the dendritic cells to uh, present them, to acquire and present the epitopes, or you can do uh, ex vivo, where you modify these cells ex vivo and then you infuse them into the individual. Um, I'm gonna go quickly through this. This is one of the approaches that one of the companies is using, and it's they're complexing the RNA with protein, and they're using this as a vaccine. This is just an example of, uh, th there's actually, if you look at RNA vaccines, you will, right now, active, I minimized, I, I limited to active um, uh, trials, you will have 51 trials. So, um, so it's certainly a very active, and it ranges from infectious diseases, like HIV, tuberculosis, uh, rabies, to cancer, uh, AML, melanoma, prostate cancer, and a lot of them are actually in phase two, phase three. So it's moving forward, the field is moving forward. Um, one example is the uh, Argos. Um, uh, it, they have developed, there's some of the, the early RNA approaches. What they did was uh, a little bit different because what they're doing is taking uh, total RNA from tumors, presenting the dendritic, uh, these RNAs to dendritic cells ex vivo and then infusing the cells back. But they have uh, very, um, this is, they're actually on phase three now, right now. And they have uh, very interesting data that supports that indeed this is a viable uh, mechanism uh, where you can have uh, um, immune responses uh, um, uh, and mount an immune response using these uh, dendritic, modified dendritic cells. The same is with uh, cancer vaccines. So this one is a study that was done uh, recently using four full-length antigens. 
and uh, in mice the response was quite uh, impressive. Um, but in, in, they did also a safety um, uh, study in humans, and it was quite uh, effective. And just to show you, um, basically, again, like I said, they take the antigens, they present it to the cells, they uh, stimulate the cells, and then they infuse them back. Um, you probably have seen this. There's commercials about this. Uh, this is actually an approved drug. Uh, so there's commercials about this drug right now. So the, one of the um, examples of how efficacious this is, as you can see, this is data from a, a phase two clinical studies. So out of 26 patients, 20 have, uh, it is a Kaplan-Meier uh, 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 curve where you see that 20 of the 26 patients responded positively. So they had an immunological response. And, uh, and when they break it down in, in, in by the number of antigens that they received, those that received more than three antigens, they mount a much better immune response. So this is something that you can quickly and, and uh, efficaciously do with RNA. And, uh, and, and the reason is you can quickly uh, build these sequences and make these uh, therapeutic molecules. Uh, this is just showing the portfolio of one of these uh, uh, companies that is moving forward in the field of RNA therapeutics. And now I, I was looking at this, and I, have, I had a slide of the previous portfolio, and it's totally different. So it's moving really quick. Uh, and it's exciting to see that uh, the field is moving forward. Um, uh, the, uh, this is just a statement, another one of those um, companies that have uh, uh, been able to um, uh, obtain a lot of funding to develop these uh, therapeutics is Moderna. And they just recently, actually I think it was, yeah, November 15 of 2017, they, um, they uh, announced their phase one study for an RNA cancer vaccine. Uh, and this is going to be in com for solid tumors, which is a challenge. Uh, and this will be in combination with Keytruda. So this is just, it's an exciting uh, field. It's moving forward relatively quick. And um, just to summarize where, where we are. So advances in, in RNA, chemistry, and processes are, are giving a viable opportunity to RNA therapeutics to move to the clinic. Um, the development of uh, delivery approaches uh, is it's moving quickly, and I think it's just a matter of time before we have a vehicle or several vehicles for different indications. It has the potential for personalized medicine. It's moving forward in, uh, uh, together with other uh, fields, such as the field of immunotherapy, and the synergy between these fields is actually gaining a lot of momentum. Um, right now, the focus is on ex vivo delivery, and this, is a, uh, and this has a, an immediate a, a therapeutic approach and actually is moving to the clinic very quick. So this is just, this is what I have to present today, and if you have any questions, I briefly just touch on where the field is and how we are addressing some of these issues, and us as a group also, we are working to address some of these issues as well, and it's exciting uh, times for that, so thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bruno. Thank you very much, Dr. Bruno. It was great talk. We have uh, time for a couple of quick questions. Please, Dr. Kugel, go ahead. I agree. That was a wonderful talk. Wonderful overview of the field. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, also relevant to our uh, center, uh, this week, uh, Moderna announced a uh, cooperation with AstraZeneca for a heart failure drug. So um, RNA and putting uh, relaxing. The, um, I, I'm not sure how they're delivering those, uh, but that'll be presumably intercoronary or mm -hmm. systemic delivery, and I'm not sure how the RNA is protected uh, until the nanoparticle, probably, uh, if it has some specificity for uh, cardiac circulation, <coughs> probably not, um, but it'll be interesting to see how that mm -hmm. uh, program uh, develops. But I, I'd just like to uh, highlight uh, that the this is uh, the RNA therapeutics program that you're developing here, uh, Avon, is so unique because there's nothing like it in academic medicine. There are companies out there, as you pointed out, that are developing RNA therapeutics. And 
this is probably the only academic center in the world, at least to my knowledge, that is developing RNA therapeutics and very close to, to making our uh, first uh, product. And um, that that does it, I have some, it's exciting, but there's some complications with doing that in an academic uh, center. Usually we're used to doing, generating, you know, uh, re we're doing research here. But uh, with the therapeutics program, you also are generating intellectual property and trade secrets that you have to protect because this is very expensive business trying to make a, a biotherapeutic a molecule. As you, as you mentioned, Yvonne, these things cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and their development costs hundreds of millions of dollars if you really want to get it all the way into the clinic. So um, it does uh, represent some challenges for us as an academic center because uh, it's a little bit different uh, regulatory, uh, intellectual property, uh, and, and, and those considerations are different than what we're usually uh, considering uh, in academic medicine. But we'll find a way, uh, certainly have uh, found our way very close now to getting uh, into the GMP production of uh, RNA. Thanks. And I had a question. Yes. Just to get an idea of the, uh, what the scale is. How much, uh, what is the range of mRNA dosing that you need for human therapeutic? So it, it varies depending on In the... In terms of mass. So it varies depending on the indication and the application. So for instance, if you're looking at ex vivo uh, manipulations, it could be between 20 milligrams to 1 to 2 grams. Uh, if you're looking at systemic <coughs> delivery, then we're talking about 40, 50 grams of RNA. So that's a real production challenge. So that's a big production challenge. And uh, uh, so this is uh, outside of the scope of, of, of the capabilities mm -hmm. of this group. But um, I mean, something, for instance, such as uh, non-viral <coughs> integration approaches, you can use as little as 20 milligrams. Uh, and as that could- what? 20 milligrams of RNA, um, and, and that's a very feasible approach. And so ex vivo applications, like I mentioned, are very viable and very possible, and, uh, and this is why the field is moving forward with these sorts of uh, 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 applications. But the beauty of it is that that's what immunotherapy is, and for the most part, immunotherapies are, especially the cell-based immunotherapies, they're taking the, the uh, cells ex vivo, manipulating them and then infusing them back. So the fact that do both fields are co-evolving uh, makes gives it a, a very nice uh, momentum and synergy. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have to move on to the next presentation, and now our next presenter is Dr. Amy Carpenter. She is the newest member of RNA core team. She graduated from Baylor College of Medicine this year with a PhD in molecular and cellular biology, and her PhD project was aimed to determine the functional consequence of alternative splicing of calcium handling genes during postnatal development of skeletal muscle. This work was awarded with travel grant and poster award from Oligonucleotide Therapeutic Society and is published in <coughs> eLife Journal. Dr. Camp Carpenter joined Dr. Bruna's team as a postdoctoral fellow to work on the codon optimization to improve uh, RNA stability and translational efficiency. To complement Dr. Bruno's talk, she's going to present paper titled uh, Shortly poly a Tails, a Concerned Feature of Highly Expressed Genes. Please, Amy. Thank you for the kind introduction, and thank you for this opportunity to talk uh, about a related paper to what we do at the RNA core. So Dr. Bruno gave a good background about where the field stands currently and also uh, what congruent technologies can be used with mRNA therapeutics such as cellular therapies. Uh, one important component is our actual mRNA products that we create in the RNA core. And one thing about mRNA is mRNA biology is continually to evolve to understand biology more and more. And so we want to incorporate that into the products that we produce at the RNA core. Uh, mRNA at its basic level uh, consists of a five prime cap, untranslated regions, uh, five prime and three prime regions, a codeine uh, sequence that is translated into the protein product, and then ended with a poly A tail. All these different aspects we can manipulate in our mRNA products to create more stable, better translated uh, mRNAs that can be uh, highly utilized for mRNA therapeutics. What's focused on this paper here that I will be presenting 
is codon op optimization and poly A tail length. I'll first go into background about codon optimization and poly A tail length. So for codon optimization, the mRNA is read in a triplicate as codons during translation to add on uh, single amino acids to the growing uh, polypeptide chain. Within a particular cell type or cellular condition, there are different pools of um, transfer RNAs. And based off this, uh, different codons within the mRNA can either increase the, the rate of translation or decrease. So we can use these codons uh, based off the tRNAs that are present to either optimize codon optimization to increase translation efficiency or use uh, less efficient codons to decrease translation efficiency. While the poly A tail, its main purpose is to protect from exonuclease de degradation of the mRNA. Um, overall, what has been seen in the field is that shortened poly A tails are a destabilizing feature, while as longer poly A tails are stabilizing. Uh, one of the main proteins that interacts with the poly A tail is the poly A binding protein. Uh, this can interact with different proteins. Uh, in the case of translational factors such as EIF4G, uh, these can be stabilizing to create a pseudo loop to incre increase translation efficiency, or it can react, interact with different um, protein complexes to increase uh, deadenylation of the mRNA. So it would lead to degradation of the mRNA. Uh, so poly A binding proteins can either have a positive or negative effect. And why this group decided to start looking into poly A tails is more recent studies have shown that uh, this dogma that shortened poly A tails uh, being destabilizing isn't necessarily true in different conditions and different cell types. So they wanted to further understand this and see how true this dogma is that poly A uh, shortening leads to destabilization and poly A tail lengthening leads to stabilization. Uh, to do this, they created both their own data set in C. elegans uh, using M tail sequencing, so global sequencing of the poly A tails. And they also used available data sets in yeast and mice to look at both uh, poly A tail links, ribosome enrichment, uh, RNA stability, and translation of these mRNAs. Uh, together, uh, they proposed that looking at these different model organisms, they would be able to look across eukaryotes uh, to see uh, the relationship between poly A tail length and gene expression and translation rates. And just as a further note of how I set up my slides, uh, since they're uh, looking at different species, uh, in the bottom I indicate with a picture and the species name of what the data is representative of. Uh, so first we started out, uh, they started with their own data set that they created uh, with the mTEL sequencing. And they look globally across all the transcripts uh, within their data set. And that they see that there is uh, a median of about 52 uh, poly A tail length. And what you also notice is that there's these peaks around 30, 60, 90, uh, meaning that there's more species <coughs> at the 30, and then slightly less but still abundant amount of poly A species that are 60 and then 90. And they hypothesize this is due to the fact that the poly A binding protein is 20, uh, has a footprint of 25 to 30 <coughs> nucleotides. And so they see that this is consistent uh, with the poly A binding footprint. And they hypothesize that the reason why you're seeing this step ladder effect is due to poly A pruning. Uh, but then what they went to focus on further was this idea that the poly A tails are in general shorter when they, what they uh, expected to be. Uh, so then they categorized the poly A tails per transcript and they were able to categorize in what they considered medium length poly A tails in gray. And then in blue would be the long poly A tails. Uh, and then the short poly A tails are in red. And to categorize this further, they wanted to see how this um, was correlated with different uh, gene ontology categories. And what they were surprised to see is that the short poly A tails 
were predominantly found in ribosome translation nucleosome uh, type genes, which are typically found to be highly expressed genes. So this was what they found to be very surprising. And so they wanted to look further into why these highly expressed genes, or what they would expect to be highly expressed genes, had very short, short poly A tails. And sure enough, that's what the data showed when they uh, looked at both their transcript abundance and categorized them into three groups, highest, medium, and lowest. Uh, in red is the short poly A tails, the majority of the transcripts that have high transcript abundance have short poly A tails, while the lowest abundant transcripts have the longest poly A tails. And so this uh, data just focused on the amount of transcripts, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these uh, RNAs are being used in the polysomes to be actively translated into proteins. And so they wanted to see the correlation for both codon optimization, as I mentioned previously, is a marker for translation efficiency. And they also wanted to look at ribosome enrichment. And if they look at the abundance of the RNA and codon optimization, as they expected from other uh, previous literature results, is that codon optimization is high for abundant transcripts. And they also see that uh, transcripts that have optimal codon optimizations are also uh, translated at a higher rate than other transcripts. They incorporated this uh, to include their poly A data as well. Uh, so first, they switched to their data being uh, presented in a way that's looking at the efficiency of codon optimization. So they uh, went for a group that had low codon optimization in red, medium or moderate codon optimization in gray, and in blue was high codon optimization, so high codon optimization meaning uh, high translation efficiency. And if they look at the median poly A tail length, they see the one uh, transcripts that have the highest codon optimization also have the shortest poly A tail length. They see the ones that have the transcripts that have the highest codon optimization are also the most abundant, as shown in the previous data. And they also see that they have the highest enrichment for the ribosomes. And so all these uh, three aspects for mRNA stabil uh, stabilization and uh, translation efficiency are correlated with the shortened poly A tails. Now, as I mentioned, uh, this data set that they created was in C. elegans, so they wanted to see whether this was just a phenomenon seen only in C. elegans, or if they can find this in other data sets of other eukaryotids. So they did the same analysis in both yeast and mice, and they see the same correlations. Uh, once again, this data is uh, broken down into codon op optimization, with red being the highest and blue being the lowest. And you see that when you look at the poly A tail length, that the highest codon optimization also has the shortest poly A tails for yeast and mice. There's increased ribone, ribosome enrichment, and these are the most highly abundant transcripts. And once again, to highlight their abundance, they have a shorter half life. And so one of their uh, few more molecular tech, uh, uh, techniques of addressing this uh, question is they actually uh, took in yeast a transcript, uh, HIS3, and they took it and changed the codons to have low codon optimization all the way up to what their uh, algorithms would predict to be the highest codon optimization. And comparing, and comparing the 0% codon optimization, 50%, and 100% is that they see that there are shorter uh, poly A tails when codon optimization is the highest, and they see a more diffused length in the poly A tails with zero codon optimization. So seeing a high correlation uh, between manipulating the codon optimization and poly A tails. And so what they hypothesize with this is that you have a long poly A tail initially, 
And with weak translation substrates, uh, this poly A tail remains long. And then um, complexes that degrade the poly A tail can interact with the poly A binding protein and lead to rapid de de uh, decay of the mRNA. Um, versus if the poly A tail is pruned and shortened uh, to the length of one or two poly A binding proteins, this creates a protective effect and more efficient uh, translation uh, and more interaction with the EIF4G. Uh, so the takeaways from the paper is that there are strong correlations between the poly A tails and the high expression and translation of these genes. Um, this gives us a better understanding of mRNA stability and translation and this is something that can be a uh, future applied to MR mRNA therapeutic products. Um, the main faults to this paper would be the fact that a lot of this data is correla correlative. Only very few figures actually molecu molecularly manipulate this to see uh, how true this is. And uh, one thing uh, that they didn't show in this paper but would be good to see as a follow-up paper would be a mechanism for this poly A pruning since this is mainly hypothesis based. But it could be an interesting way that shortened poly A tails are a way to stabilize the mRNAs than to actually degrade them. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. We open for questions. Any questions? Yes. Question. Um, what do you do? You have a hypothesis on why codon optimization would lead to poly A pruning and protection mechanism? <coughs> Um, so they don't address that in their paper, but what I would expect is that if you're having higher translation efficiency, there's more likely that the poly A binding protein is going to interact with uh, EIF4G versus other complexes that are going to lead to degradation. Um, and so potentially there's more chance of the poly A tail being pruned to the correct length versus completely degraded. So I can't hear you. So the ERS will cause high GC, but high GC. So the high GC create creates with the shorter poly and I think it's really not. Basically, it means that you need to have high GC content and low AT content. Yeah. So. Um, they see the correlation between the codon optimization and the short tails. Uh, they specifically see it with the 30 or 60 nucleotides. So um, it's not necessarily that it has to be short. So if you go below 30 nucleotides for the poly A tail, it actually uh, no longer correlates and it's uh, degradative, um, leads to decay. Uh, but you do see that correlation between codon optimization and about the 30 nucleotide link poly A tail. Do they observe any correlation between gene length and the poly A tail length? Correlation between what? Between gene length, the length of gene and the length of poly A. Um, so this was ma their main um, data was in C. elegans, and they did see a correlation between shorter genes uh, being high, highly <coughs> translated uh, than longer genes and longer poly A tails. Uh, not lasting as long and uh, having more instability. They define colon optimization. What are they calling colon optimization? Uh, so their codon optimization is based off the fact of tRNA pools and translation rates mm -hmm. due to that. Um, the codon frequency. Yeah. Want to see more is like as you mentioned, um, more of the validation analysis, mm -hmm. northern blots or any other techniques, yeah. or at least enrichment of tRNAs to show that it is a ribosome coordination. Mm -hmm. um, I agree. To say that you know this is what we see in a, um, yeah. in vitro or in vivo. Yes, I would agree that they need more validation, but I think it's an interesting. Um, <coughs> new uh, way to look at poly A tails, and I think that that can be further built upon in the academic research field. 
you show the interesting distribution of the length of the Collier tails uh, that uh, were in multiples of 30. So mm -hmm. uh, you, you saw peaks at 120, 90, and 60. And um, I was just wondering, in that experiment, did they inhibit endonucleases or not? Um, uh, no. So. That was first seen just with their uh, tail seek, so they're global looking at how they uh, sequenced the poly A tails. And then um, they also did a second way of pulse labeling the poly A tails, and they also saw that same um, 30, 60, uh, 90 nucleotide length, but they didn't do any endonuclease or exonuclease um, inhibition. So does that mean that that, that, that step function it's a function of uh, the poly A binding proteins protecting that poly A tail from uh, digestion by endo or exo. Yeah, so that's, uh, they don't prove that well, but uh, their hypothesis is that if a poly A binding protein is binding, then it will only degrade to where the poly A binding tail is binding to. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? And I think we can adjourn our meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Irene, for the video.